Well, so welcome to this week's uh, Durham Geometry and Topology Seminar. So it's a pleasure to have uh, Julian Shoyo from uh, Cardiff, who is going to talk about a general approach to stability of the soap bubble theorem and related problems. So thank you, Julian. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Fernando. And um, thanks for giving me the opportunity to be back to Durham, um, at least virtually. It's nice to see you all. And uh, after this nice uh, Zoom tutorial, let me start um, talking about classical uh, problems in geometry. So we talk about the soap bubble theorem. Um, and we all from, uh, know from our everyday experience that uh, soap bubbles uh, tend uh, towards being round. Um, they want to minimize a certain energy, um, which makes them uh, be round. And just to give you a little uh, refresher on how that looks in nature, I have like a very short video where when you, we see, you see when you bring a soap bubble out of shape, then it doesn't take very long until it wobbles itself back to a round uh, shape. Okay. And um, the reason is very roughly in a physical model, the, um, the physical system wants to minus, um, minimize its total energy which is in the simplest model you can imagine uh, given by the surface tension uh, coefficient times surface area. Where the surface tension coefficient is basically a constant of the model. So it's given and determined by the um, environment of where the problem is uh, located or the experiment is located. So in, in general, so that would mean that actually all you have to do is minimize the surface area. Um, while of course the soap bubble fixes an enclosed unit volume of air. So the interior volume is not affected from a deformation, um, but of course the surface area is affected. Um, and to bring the surface area back into, um, into a minimal uh, state, you enclose the volume by doing that. So what this soap bubble is doing actually, it is trying to solve the isoparametric problem Namely, it finds the shape of a closed surface that minimizes surface area given fixed volume, right? So in uh, mathematical terms, it is minimizing this uh, surface area, uh, this um, isoparametric ratio, which is area to the three half over volume, just to make that quantity scaling invariant. So any sphere would be a minimizer of the problem. Um, Okay, and now we look at minimizers of this problem and you can calculate from um, standard variational methods that um, a closed minimizer of this ratio has always has constant mean curvature. And this is valid in every dimension. Um, so it, you can look at curves or you can look at higher dimensional hypersurfaces of any Euclidean space. Um, right. So the natural uh, question in this context is, can we characterize the shapes that have constant mean curvature? Um, because this would characterize the shapes of minimizers of the isoparametric ratio, right? And this is a very classical problem, which has been addressed as early as the 19th century. Um, namely, the question is whether an embedded constant mean curvature hypersurface must be a sphere. And First results for convex hypersurfaces go basically go back to works of Darabu and um, many other people in the, in, the in the 19th century actually. But in this generality, as I have posed the question here, this was solved by Alexandrov in, uh, in the 60s, the 1960s. So the question is plainly yes, under those assumptions, so we have embedded constant mean curvature closed, then we must be a sphere. Um, this will fail if you replace embeddedness by, ice, uh, by, um, by immersed, because there are these famous counterexamples to Tubente. So they, he constructed um, a torus, a closed torus, which is immersed and has constant mean curvature. So um, if you drop any of those assumptions here, then, then this fails. But this is a very clean and nice result, right? It has uh, like minimal necessary assumptions. 
um, that you post and then you get the result. Um, the nice feature of this kind of question and problem is that we are posing, we are, we are basically imposing local um, assumptions, right? Being a uh, constant mean curvature means that you, you can determine that at every, in, in, in arbitrarily small neighborhoods of every point. So um, this is a local question, but the outcome is a global result, right? And this is very powerful that you can basically get from local assumptions to global um, topological result. Um, and this has implications in practice, uh, which are still kind of hypo um, hypothetical, but let me, let, me, let me make this following um, mind experiment. So let's suppose any person um, can determine the curvature of a certain size around itself. So let me say currently I am in Freiburg um, due to COVID reasons um, at my apartment. And let me say I can just measure like, like 20 meters around my um, apartment. I can measure the curvature of the, of the, of the, of the earth that I'm, I'm living on. And let's say every person in the world can do that without leaving the own area one can make a precise curvature map of the region of the property where the person lives. Okay, and um, then you can just calculate how many persons you need, right? The, 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 the earth has a certain surface area. So we need like a capital N persons where N is estimated by the area of the earth times the area of the region that a person can measure. And you need that amount of persons to determine whether the earth is a round sphere, but no person has to leave the region where it lives, right? So they can just collect their data on a Zoom meeting, for example, after they have measured their, their property. And then if by accident, every says, okay, my, my property has curvature one, and everybody says that, then we know the earth must be a sphere. Um, this is a powerful method to get uh, gl global information from local input. Of course, in practice, this will never happen, even if our Earth was like, like much rounder than it actually is, any deviation from the constant would, would fail this experiment, of course, right? Because it, Alexandrov's theorem says the curvature has to be plainly constant without any deviation. So in, in everyday life, it would be much nicer to have a stability result for that, namely, um, what happens if we, if we knew that we are getting close to a certain value? Um, let's say we are in n dimensions, and every, and and the mean curvature is close to, to the reference value that belongs to the curvature of a sphere. Um, so let's say we make this mind experiment again, and people collect their data that they are having, and let's say they make some, they all of them deviate by a certain um, number delta from the reference value n minus one with their mean curvature measurement. Then the question would be, um, can we conclude that the distance of the earth to a sphere is still um, under control by a constant c and an epsilon where this epsilon goes to zero when our delta error goes to zero? So this is precisely a stability question of this problem. And this is much more what we can exp uh, what we can try actually measure in everyday life because note that I didn't specify the value of delta. It can be very big. So if if we get like a very bad error, we can still get an estimate at least in terms of that error. So this would be a very uh, apl uh, applicable um, estimate still, with the particular information that if the error is small, then our estimate, uh, our, the quantity which we want to estimate would also be small. So this would be full information about this problem actually. Okay, so, um, and if we rephrase that in a similar way as we earlier ref um, opposed Alexandrov's problem, we would say, um, this is the stability question, whether an embedded, embedded almost constant mean curvature hypersurface must be close to a sphere. Um, and this is a question that has been addressed um, also. I ba basically, since the solution of Alexandrov's problem, uh, for the convex case, um, Pogorelov and um, 
other people have, have gotten very satisfactory results. Um, but the convex case is very restricted. I mean, it's much more uh, restricted than embedded hypersurfaces. So it is in, in the generality that, as, that the problem is posed, very recently results came out. Um, and the answer depends on, of course, depends on how you, what you mean by almost enclosed, because you have to fix some, some topology, some measurement in order to make that um, kind of well-posed problem. <clears throat> But there are recent works by um, Magnanini Borghesi, um, like two or three years ago, um, they, they uh, answered affirmatively if, so in case that we understand the closeness to a sphere by Hausdorff close, this is basically uh, like a C0 closeness, like Hausdorff close means that your, your surface fits into a small annulus lying around your sphere. So it's basically um, in C naught uh, distance. And how badly can your mean curvature deviate from a constant? In what topology do we mean that? It is actually in L1, which is much weaker than, than what I post here. So here for simplicity, I've just said, let's say our mean curvature globally ranges between those two values. Um, this is not as necessary as, it, um, as one could imagine. So it would be fine to impose an L1 closeness and still get Hausdorff closeness to a sphere. And I will explain that further uh, later on, where that L1 closeness comes from. Okay. And then we had this constant C, which, is, which appeared in the estimate where we had on the right-hand side C times epsilon. And what you have to do here is you have to allow, to allow C depend on an in-radius bound. So you have to basically put a global curvature bound on your surface because otherwise you can have phenomena, which I will also explain later on. Um, so these are the assumptions that Magnanini Pogesi make in their um, approach. And then they conclude that um, the distance of the surface to a sphere must be small or at least controlled in terms of this L1 closeness. And the purpose of this talk is to discuss their approach um, and then highlight where their approach is too restrictive or very restricted to the, this particular problem. And then we relax their approach in a way that we can uh, treat similar problems, which are more of a fully nonlinear type. Um, so note that the mean curvature equation is um, a semi-linear uh, or quasi-linear equation. And um, this plays a crucial role in their analysis. And we will discuss an approach which also works for fully nonlinear type of operators. All right, so so far to the introduction, basically. Um, now I will discuss their approach of this estimate. And it, this um, is all about integral inequalities. And the idea actually goes, goes back to work of Antonio Ross from the 80s. Namely, we can make the following simple calculation. So, Ross himself used, uh, used Rayleigh type inequalities um, for hypersurfaces to get um, this computation down. And the idea is the following. So suppose that we have a function f on a domain, which is um, constant on the boundary. And then we, in this situation, we have a Rayleigh's integral identity. Uh, it says that you can write the Laplace operator to the square in the L2 norm minus the L2 norm of the Hessian of the function. You can write that as a boundary integral of the mean curvature times the normal derivative of F um, to the square. So by normal here, I always mean outward pointing. So the normal that you use in the, in the divergence theorem. Okay, so this is very nice integral identity. And now you can exploit that to make estimates. Namely the crucial quantity that uh, Magnanini Pogesi are looking at is what they call the Cauchy Schwarz deficit. And what this really is, it is the norm of the traceless part of, this, of the Hessian of F to the square, right? And you can write that as the norm of the Hessian to the square minus one over N times the trace of the Hessian to the square. Um, and note that this quantity is precisely zero 
when the Hessian um, has equal eigenvalues at every point. Okay. This is the Cauchy-Schwarz deficit. And now we can plug this into Riley's identity above here. Um, so just plugging that in. So we replace this Hessian here, oops, sorry, um, into this uh, integral. And then we rearrange a little bit because this Laplacian also cancels with this um, to up to some factor. So we can estimate, or we can write actually the um, L2 norm of the traceless Hessian in terms of the Laplace and this boundary integral. Okay, and now the difficult part to control is of course this Laplacian here because this is like a second derivative which we would like to get rid of. Um, so now comes the crucial idea that we just use a Dirichlet problem. Um, namely on that domain omega, we can use the, we, we can solve this, um, this torsion type equation where we put the Laplacian of F equals to one uh, and we, we just impose zero Dirichlet boundary uh, data. All right, so when we plug this in, then this integral here just becomes the volume of omega, okay? And now we can make some more manipulations algebraically. Uh, let me continue that on the next slide. So note that compared to the old slide, I have done nothing here except for um, multiplying and dividing by volume of omega, because note that again, the Laplace of F is, is one, right? So there, nothing happened here. But now we can use the divergence theorem uh, to get the boundary in. Uh, then we use Hölder's inequality, which gives us an area term here, and we, that gives us the normal derivative to the square. And this was on purpose because now we can compare these two integrals here, right? So we can simply nicely rewrite that um, in terms of a boundary integral of a constant h0 minus h, where this h0 is just this constant up here, which involves the area and the volume of the boundary. Um, right, so this is exactly what um, kind of explains why we get this L1 closeness of H into play, right? Because now we can say that we have the Cauchy-Schwarz deficit under control in terms of an L1 deficit of H, right? Once we know that, that the at least the function is in C1 um, on the whole domain, we have this control by the L1 deficit of H. And this is a very nice approach, right? This is a very simple divergence theorem calculation. And you see immediately how this L1 uh, closeness comes into play. The only problem is now we have to turn this estimate into an estimate of the distance to a sphere because this is the Cauchy-Schwarz deficit. We have a priori no idea how that relates to the Hausdorff distance um, of the hypersurface to the sphere. And the key observation of Magnanini and Pogesi is now that um, the function f minus q is harmonic, where q is the reference function, which belongs to a ball sort of, right? This is, if you calculate the Laplace of q, you will get one, right? Because this is a squared distance to a point, the center c. So this function here, f minus q is harmonic. And note that q is really the model solution because this is the solution of the Dirichlet problem when omega is a ball, right? And, and this is kind of the function that you have to compare f to if you want closeness to a ball. And now you're in the nice shape that f minus q is a harmonic function. And for harmonic functions, we have perfect estimates. And together with the precise knowledge of this function Q, Magnanini and Pogesi were able to get via harmonic estimates, get to a, dis to a distance estimate of the boundary to a sphere. Namely that this function F minus Q here must be small um, and hence F is actually almost this model function. And then you also know that the boundary is almost a sphere. So this is the whole approach that they are taking. Um, so let me, let me wrap this up in some comments on this approach. So what we have seen is that the L2 Cauchy-Schwarz deficit is controlled by the C1 norm of F and an L1 deficit of H uh, compared to a constant H0, okay? So, and here's what I, what I just said. So they, 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 use, they use this um, 
these specific estimates, which apply to harmonic functions, come to uh, with the explicit knowledge of Q to get uh, estimates. And um, the key of this talk and why this whole, why I actually why I got interested in this problem, is that I found a shortcut to this um, approach, where Q is not necessary anymore. You don't you don't need to know Q to get from this estimate to a roundness estimate of um, the boundary of omega to a sphere. So basically you can skip this whole part on the bottom of the slide and still get an estimate. And this is useful to, um, this approach is very useful because we can transfer this kind of estimates to other problems which are related. And, but this comes later. So let me give you that shortcut. It's the, basically the, the, the whole deal is the following theorem which is to, yeah, it's going to appear on archive as soon as I get it done. It is, the math is done, but the paper is not wrapped up yet. So it will be like two or three weeks, I hope. Um, the estimate is as follows. So maybe, maybe focus first on the estimate because that is what it's all about. So it says that you can estimate the distance of the boundary to, to a sphere by the L2 norm of the Cauchy-Schwarz deficit. So this is basically what we all expected after what I've told you before. Um, the precise statement is that what is this function f here? Um, this function f has three properties by assumption. Um, in short, you can say that omega must be a defining domain or f is a defining function for omega, meaning that it is positive in the interior of omega. The boundary is a level set. It, zero doesn't matter here, of course, because um, you can put any constant here just by a translation of the function. But the key is also that the gradient on the boundary must be non-zero so that the boundary is a hypersurface. So all of this obviously fails if this gradient assumption is, is violated because if your function, for example, is constant, then such an estimate is of course not possible because your right-hand side is zero, but um, the distance of the boundary can be any domain, right? So you need this uh, gradient non-vanishing condition. Right, and for such functions, you actually get this estimate. Um, we're not assuming that we have a PDE or anything. It's just a defining function. This is quite general. The only things that you have to include is that you need a curvature bound. Uh, well, yeah, you need a curvature bound at the boundary, which like transfers to an L to a C two bound on the function f. And you need a uniform control on this gradient non-vanishing condition. So. It should not be close to zero. It, so the constant will depend on how close this is to zero. Um, this is also expected, right? If your gradient becomes small, then level sets can be very spread out. So they can be huge. So this is, this is also expected, this kind of condition that comes in. Um, OK, but this is the estimate. And this is good, because now we know that if the L2 Cauchy-Schwarz deficit is zero, then you actually must be a sphere. Right, so this basically solves the uh, Alexandrov problem with this kind of approach um, and also the stability result. Um, also, let me mention that this result also works in conformally flat Riemannian manifolds. So such a result also holds in the sphere, for example, or the hyperbolic space or anything that's con uh, conformally flat. All you have to include is the dependence on the conformal factor um, in this constant here just as a remark. Um, right, and also this settles the L1 stability for the soap bubble theorem by the previous computation, right? Let me go back. So we have seen that we can, um, when we choose F to be this um, uh, function Laplace, which solves Laplace F equals one, then this computation gives you an explicit estimate of the distance to a sphere, which is back here. Um, in terms of the L2 bound of the mean curvature, right? And this is the shortcut. So we don't need this harmonic function Q in order to, and these harmonic kind of estimates that Magnanini Pogesi use. Um, and this is nice because we are not restricted to cases where Laplace F equals a one, right? We can actually drop this. If we have other functions F, then we still get such an estimate. Um, Okay, and we will see more applications like in the second part of the talk. <clears throat> All right, so 
let me highlight the main features again. So f is not assumed to solve a PDE in this theorem. It is just a defining function of the domain. Um, right, so I said this. So of course, in practice, you always, you, you often use a solve a particular PDE to get such a function, right? But it doesn't have to be a particular PDE. That's the important bit. Um, right, some comments about this derivative bound. I have already justified the bounds on the gradient here. Uh, just to control the level set, you need a gradient bound. But this derivative bound, the second derivative bound is important because um, there are counterexamples if you relax this. For example, you can have bubbling of uh, hypersurfaces. So by, by bubbling, I mean take two big spheres and join them by a very thin, um, thin neck, right? Then you have a small L1, um, I mean curvature, uh, compared to a constant, but of course you're not close to a sphere. But of course you have very big curvature in this neck region, right? So um, this is like like a key counterexample to 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 like this almost umbilical type estimates that you you always need a curvature bound or an inner radius bound um, to to prevent bubbling. Okay, so that just justifies that also this um, assumption is at least partially necessary. It is not very clear how, how well you can improve that, but you can definitely not get rid of it. Uh, so that explains a little bit of this C2 uh, function. So in general, this, this allows a very general principle that I want to state in one sentence. So whenever you have a rigidity result, for example, that when you say constant mean curvature implies a sphere. And when you have a proof of that, which discards the L2 norm of the cauchy schwarz deficit, then you can also get an associated stability result. And there are, there are well, the, a whole zoo of problems that are solved by this uh, kind of approach. So in many, in many rigidity results, people just throw away um, such a cauchy schwarz term. Um, and whenever they throw away such a term, you can make the analysis quantitative and get an associated stability result using this theorem here. And I expect plenty of more applications um, of this uh, approach. And a few of them I will give you now. But I think we are halfway through of the talk. Maybe there's, there's time for questions in between if there are any things that you want to ask right away. Sorry, so what is the regularity of the function f? You just need to, uh, c2, is it, right? Just c2 uh, on the function. Uh, yeah, so, so in, in some applications, you will need c2 alpha because you would get kind of like, uh, you will get shadow estimates into play. So it can happen that in some applications, you will need c2 alpha, um, but that really depends on the application. This can be relaxed also to W2, P, where P is greater than N, things like this you can do. Um, but I stated this thing in a simplicity that is easier to follow. So you can actually do some LP. Uh, you can relax this to W2, P, where P is greater than N minus one, I think, stuff like this. Yes. So kind of C2, uh, C1 alpha regularity kind of, you can, you can improve that, but um, I wanted the clean results so, so you can, uh, yeah. There are ways to get a little bit better. Okay. Is there a variational approach to stability? A variational approach to this result? To stability in general for these. Oh yes, I will come to that later. There is a variational approach and I will show you, uh, at the end of the talk, I will show you a curvature flow approach to stability results. So we will see several different approaches to stability. And this is just one approach to stability, which, which I will, um, Right. This is a very general estimate, which we don't still know where this function f will come from in applications, right? So this is a very abstract result. Um, but in various geometric problems, we will get particular situations and we will see several of them now, actually. Okay, so let me continue with the first application. Oh no, sorry, before, before that, we, I say some words about the proof. Um, let me say some words about the proof. So 
the key observation is that we can express the um, second derivative of f, the Hessian matrix of f, in terms of the second fundamental form of the hypersurface. Right, so there's a formula which you can easily calculate because, because the boundary is a level set of the function f, we can express the Hessian of f at the, in, in tangent directions in terms of the second fundamental form of the boundary times the gradient of the function. Um, right, and hence we can also express the Hessian, the traceless Hessian in terms of the traceless second fundamental form. So this A, zero, uh, A ring here is a well-known quantity um, in hypersurface theory. It's just the, the traceless second fundamental form which gives you the deviation of the principal curvatures at the boundary um, square, right? This is just the, the, you have N minus one principal curvatures and this quantity norm of the second fundamental form just gives you the square distance of this, of these principal curvatures. And the key is that this is a much more known kind of pinching quantity for spheres, right? Because recall um, that there is another very classical result from hypersurface theory, which is due to Darboux from the 19th century, which says that if the trace of the second fundamental form is zero, then the boundary is a sphere. Actually, Wilhelm is a perfect expert on this uh, kind of questions as he has worked so much on um, umbilical hypersurfaces. So this is like his expertise. So I'm, I'm, I'm um, interested in, in comments and questions by Wilhelm later on about this. So, so this is a much more known kind of rigidity result for the boundary where you have the traceless second fundamental form zero gives, gives you the boundary of sphere. And also the stability question for this result is much more known. Um, which of course asks well, what happens if the second fund, if the traceless part of the of A is small, is the hypersurface close to a sphere? And this is a question that has been much, much investigated. Um, of course, pioneered again by Pogorelov in the convex setting, but in a general setting and with L2 estimates, uh, there's re there is um, there are results by Delelis and Müller. Um, this should be double L, not there, it's not three of them. Um, they proved in 2006 that you can actually control the, uh, the, the Hausdorff distance by the L2 norm of the traceless part. And then there are other works by Topping and Grosjean um, that give similar results. But the version that actually I need today um, is due to myself and Julian Roth uh, from a few years ago. Um, basically, that it says that you can estimate the distance of the boundary to a sphere um, by the by an LP norm of the traceless part of the second fundamental form, uh, where you need some power alpha, which depends on, on N and P, and the constant also depends on an LP norm of the second fundamental form. So this is very similar to the result that I've presented before. Um, the link is the relation between the traceless Hessian and the traceless second fundamental form. Um, right, and this is used uh, crucially, but it's very clear how it's used now, right? Because we can control the traceless Hessian by the traceless second fundamental form. Um, but then, of course, we need many, many things to control everything. So it's it still is technically the philosophy is very simple, but the proof of the transition from this theorem that you see here to the previous theorem uh, it still takes several pages because you need the gradient under control and stuff like that. And you need to control the mean curvature, which appears here. So this is all uh, technical, but um, the, the general idea is very clear now from, from knowing this kind of stability estimate. Um, and if you have a very general hypersurface, this is the best you can get. If you have, for example, convex hypersurfaces, then you can improve the right-hand side here very, very nicely by, for example, by alpha, putting alpha equals to one or putting P equals to infinity. So the, the more regularity you have on your surface, the better the right-hand side gets. But in the very general case, you will not get much better than, than what you have here. Um, right. So also this works in conformally flat cases because 
we know from the previous theorem this is what what we also claimed and this is also true here and um Right, so this is a rough idea of the proof. Of course, most of the technical steps are not presented at the moment because they are not, there's just not enough time to do that. But um, right, let me come now to the applications of this because this is kind of abstract what we have done so far. Um, okay, so the first result is a related to Serene's overdetermined boundary value problem. So this is a PDE problem from the 70s and it asks under our, here's again our model equation, Laplace f equals one with theory clay data. And now Serene was asking the question whether you can determine the shape of omega if you have information about the, norm, the, the, the Neumann data as well. So if your Neumann derivative at the boundary is a constant, then um, Serene's result from the 70s says that omega must be a ball. Um, okay, so this is a perfect rigidity result in terms of the Neumann derivative of f. And in, in, um, in the course of the work that I uh, mentioned earlier by Magnanini Pogesi, where they settled the almost Alexandrov theorem, they, all, they also settled the almost serene problem. Namely, they, they showed that you can control the distance of the boundary to a ball in terms of an L1 estimate of the Neumann derivative to a constant. Right, so this is um, is in the same paper. It's the same methods. You can get an integral identity um, that relates the distance that relates the Cauchy-Schwarz deficit to this um, L1 deficit. But again, they need their harmonic function Q or their their model function Q in order to get their estimates. And one application of my theorem is that you can relax Serene's problem and still get a stability result. Um, namely, we have the following. So we can prove a certain double stability result uh, in Serene's problem. What do I mean by that? We relax the operator, the equation, by allowing a nonlinear right-hand side, which depends on the function f. So we have a function phi, which lives on the negative real axis um, sorry, and apply this function to f and solve this nonlinear equation here with theory clay data. And, um, and then we get an estimate of the distance of the boundary to a sphere in terms of all the errors that we are making in comparison to the model equation, right? Namely, we have this um, Neumann derivative um, deficit here. And here we have the deficit of phi to a constant function phi, right? So phi of zero in the in Serene's problem, this would be one. So here's just the error that how far phi deviates from the constant. And this capital phi here is just the, in, the integrated uh, phi. So this is basically all, also zero if phi is a constant, All right? So this is, um, this actually measures the distance of omega to a sphere in terms of errors of both data on the Dirichlet problem, namely the constant Neumann and the constant right-hand side in the equation. And um, note that it is not possible here anymore to use the harmonic function um, approach because we don't know uh, the model harmonic function. We, do, we don't know the model solution of this equation. Well, we do know it, right? Because we know how the, um, we know Dirichlet problem on the, on the ball, we can express with help of Green's function but there, is, there seems no way to extract enough information to get the old approach through. So this is, um, it was useful to have the relaxation of, the, of this Cauchy-Schwarz deficit estimate here. Um, okay, yeah, this is the first um, generalization of Serene's problem, uh, the first application of the theorem. And uh, I don't want to go into further proof, so this, you need a similar L2 estimate of the Cauchy-Schwarz deficit, kind of similar to Rayleigh's computation earlier, uh, but a little bit more complicated. Um, and then you get an explicit estimate of the Cauchy-Schwarz deficit in terms of all of these quantities. And then you can just plug in my theorem to get the distance to a sphere. Um, all right, uh, let's come to the next application. 
So I want to discuss several things just to show you the flexibility of the result. Um, namely, we discuss the heinz akasha inequality. The heinz akasha inequality is a estimate, an integral estimate of hypersurfaces. Um, namely, well, it basically goes back to Antonio Ross uh, and some previous works. So if you have a domain which is mean convex, meaning that the mean curvature is positive, then you can estimate the integral over n minus one over the mean curvature uh, is greater than n times the volume of omega. And the, the key is again, we have the rigidity result is the equality case occurs precisely on balls. And um, right, I want to focus now on non-Euclidean versions of this. Um, therefore, let me introduce some notation. So if we have a space form, for example, the sphere or the hyperbolic space, then we can write the ambient metric in geodesic polar coordinates, where theta is the sine in the sphere case or the hyperbolic sine in the, in the hyperbolic case. And then the heinz akasha inequality in these spaces looks like this. And this is basically due to uh, Simon Brendle and um, Chu and uh, Chao Sha. Uh, so it basically looks exactly the same. The only difference is you need this nonlinear theta prime now. In the Euclidean space, this is one. But in the general space form, this is the cosine or the hyperbolic cosine of the radial distance. And u is the generalized support function of the hypersurface, um, which is in the Euclidean case, this would be precisely the volume of omega. Okay, this whole integral here. Right, this is the heinz akasha inequality. And also we have equality precisely on geodesic balls. And what I can do now with my um, stability result is we can get an almost version of this. Right, so here's the stability in the non-Euclidean heinz akasha estimate. Um, let me skip the details because the philosophy is the most important thing. Um, note that this thing here is positive but if it's small, then the distance must also be, um, if the error is small, then the distance of M to a sphere must be small too, right? So this is, this here is a non-negative quantity. And if it happens to be epsilon, for example, then you have this distance estimate in terms of epsilon. Um, right, uh, this is precisely what it says. And now we let, I would like to discuss the proof of that a little bit because how do we get from the integral estimates to this um, stability uh, result? Um, so it also comes down to solving a Dirichlet problem, but now we have to um, include the ambient curvature here. So this is K is the sectional curvature of the ambient space. We solve this modified um, Dirichlet problem. And what we also need here is a quantitative Hopf-Lemma because recall in the original theorem, we had this, um, gradient assumption uh, where we, with the constant dependent on the lower bound on the gradient. So in this situation, from, from Hopf's boundary point lemma, we know that the gradient must not be zero, but we need an explicit estimate. And this is a lemma that, will, that I would produce in the, in the paper um, where you can make quantitative Hopf's boundary point lemma in this situation and get such an estimate in terms of the inner radius. This is just a maximum principle kind of thing. It's not very difficult. <clears throat> and then the second important ingredient here is this generalized Rayleigh formula. So we have seen the Euclidean Rayleigh formula earlier, but in the space form, you can get a similar thing where you just have to account for the curvature and this nonlinear um, uh, warping factor in the ambient metric, right? So you have similar thing. And then you plug this in and do very similar computations than we did before. This is then pretty much straightforward to, to do like kind of estimate that we have seen at the very beginning of the talk. So you get from, from this difference here on the left-hand side, you get the Cauchy-Schwarz deficit in to play. And then you can use the, the general stability result uh, to, get, to get this heinz akasha thing. Okay, so this was the second application. And um, I think I have like a few minutes left. So I come to Wilhelm's question and discuss a variational 
um, application or a variational kind of approach to stability problems. And for this purpose, I would like to discuss a certain set of inequalities, which are important in convex geometry, uh, the alexandrov fenchel inequalities. Um, so for a convex domain, we can look at the volume of the epsilon parallel body. So B is a ball, epsilon small constant. This here is just the, the, um, the set. This is like the epsilon neighborhood around omega. And the absolute value is the, is the volume of this set. And Steiner's formula says that you have a expansion, a polynomial expansion of this in terms of epsilon with some well-defined coefficients wk, which are called the queer mass integrals of omega. And these are, in the smooth case, those are constants, uh, those are functions which can be expressed in terms of um, the curvature on the boundary. So w0 is just the volume of omega, but wk is an integral over a curvature quantity of the boundary. So hk is the normalized elementary sym uh, symmetric polynomial of the curvatures. And uh, right, wk can be calculated like this. Right, and they are very Im important estimates. Um, they are basically due. To, I think I don't know. I don't even know who proved them first. I think Minkowski. Um, at least particular cases are due to Minkowski. Uh, the full set probably to Fenchel and Yesen, Alexandrov. So they say that the the you have these precise sharp estimates. Wk plus one is greater than wk um, normalized and normalized so that we have scale invariance with equality precisely on balls. And we note that for k equals 1, this is just the isoparametric inequality. So these are just generalizations of the isoparametric inequality, which makes them interesting in geometry. And today, I would like to discuss uh, stability results for this. In the convex case, this has been well known. But there are non-convex versions of this. Um, in particular, the inequalities themselves are um, uh, generalized by Peng Fai Guan and Junfang Li for star-shaped and k-convex hypersurfaces. By k-convex, I mean that the principal curvatures range in the in the guarding cones gamma k, um, which are defined by um, positivity of the symmetric polynomial up to order k. All right. So the let me just stress the, in the, the inequalities here are valid for star-shaped and k-convex domains with equality precisely on balls. And we also have the um, stability here. And I stress that it's the non-convex case because the convex case has been known basically due to uh, Schneider, I think. Um, so about the same thing, the error in the geometric inequality determines the distance of the hypersurface to the sphere, right? Let me just state it like this, and no further details uh, shall be mentioned now, because it's the same philosophy all over again. But the proof is interesting, I think. It's, very, it's a little bit different. It is not based on my older theorem. It is based on the curvature flow approach. Uh, well, a combination of those. So we use a curvature flow. So x is a family of embeddings of these hypersurfaces. And they move in normal direction, given by a certain speed, um, a fraction of these elementary symmetric polynomials, and u is the support function of the hypersurface. Um, so the long time existence and convergence to around sphere of this flow is due to Klaus Gerhardt, who was my PhD advisor, and John Erbis. This is one of the classical results in inverse curvature flows from the 90s. And now we can estimate the derivative of this flow. Um, the derivative of the queer mass integrals of uh, along this flow. So namely, we want to control a certain combination of those elementary symmetric polynomials in space time. So um, in this equality, I've just replaced this hk integral over hk by integral over u times hk plus one. These are like Minkowski identities, which follow from the divergence theorem. Uh, the key point is that this right-hand side here can be uh, realized as the derivative of the queer mass integral along this flow. This is the key part. This is why I'm looking at this quantity, because this is the really the derivative of the quantity that we're looking at along this flow up here. Okay. 
And now we know what this flow is doing, right? So this is like the fundamental theorem of calculus. The value at infinity is equal to one because we know that omega converges to a ball. So this is normalized. So this gives you the constant one. And at time zero, we have the quantity at the initial uh, bound at the initial domain omega, right? And note that this flow, the nice feature of this flow is that it preserves this quantity WK. So WK is the same as WK at the end, which is one. So we can just replace this. Um, and here we didn't do anything, right? So this difference here is precisely the error that we are imposing on the right-hand side of our inequality, right? This is exactly the error that we want to, that we have control on. And this appears here on the right-hand side. So we conclude that this left-hand side is controlled by our data. Um, and note that the left-hand side is basically the deficit in the Newton-McLaurin inequality, right? There are elementary inequalities for polynomials um, which are like this. And when you prove this estimate, you can also extract the quantitative error in terms of the traceless second fundamental form, right? So there is a quantitative version of this newton mclaurin thing, uh, namely, it is at least as positive as a constant times the traceless second fundamental form. And now we are in business, right? Because this thing is under control by our data from the estimate on the previous slide. And if we have this under control, then we have the traceless part under control. And this is this finishes our proof, right? Because we, we know that L2 control on the traceless second fundamental form gives us um, a distance control to a sphere by um, this previous result that I mentioned earlier in the talk. Right, so this is actually, um, oh, you can ignore this comment about H tilde. Actually, this is, a, this is, uh, this constant actually depends on this H tilde, but I didn't explicitly state it here. So can you can you can ignore this comment? Um, but right, so this gives you control on the on the traceless part, and this finishes the proof basically. Right, this is a rough idea on how this works to realize the pinching quantity as a derivative along a curvature flow. Um, uh, this is a nice approach, I think, um, and yeah, this is the third example that I wanted to mention, and this also the final one. So I thank you very much for your attention.